Welcome back to Chess TV. Today's headlines are that Europe has a new champion. The American Chess Championship starts this week and the Italian International Chess Championship has been decided. In the opening score, Alfred will introduce you to the King's Gambit. Today's chess puzzle is a checkmate in two moves and in the chess history, Anna Yuasan presents the oldest kept printed book on chess. But first out, a symbol in the Royal Automobile Club. This year, the Royal Automobile Club is celebrating the centenary of its Pall Mall Clubhouse. In order to mark the occasion and the founding in 1911 of its chess circle, a hundred board simultaneous is being held on Saturday, April 16th at the clubhouse in Pall Mall. In a truly unique format, 10 of Britain's highest rated grandmasters are taking part like Michael Adams, Luke McShane, David Howell and Julian Hodgson, to name a few. The Grandmasters will take on 10 teams of 10 players drawn from the members of the Royal Automobile Club Chess Circle, uh, the leading players from the other London club teams that are compete for the Hamilton Russell Trophy, ex-Varsity players and two teams of juniors, one from the English Chess Federation and one drawn from chess in schools and communities communities, a charity with a mission to promote chess in school, state schools and communities. The original 1911 plan for the Pall Mall Clubhouse had chess very much in mind and it has been a popular activity within the Royal Automobile Club since the first meeting of the chess circle in 1911. Over the years, the Pall Mall Clubhouse has been home to a number of significant events. In 1929, then world champion José Raúl Capablanca gave a demonstration of double chess. This chess vari variation is now often referred to as Bug House. The clubhouse has also hosted numerous visits from leading figures of the chess world, including the former world champion Gary Kasparov. Telkom Indonesia and the Indonesian Chess Federation organized the Telin International Chess Tournament 2011 on April 1st to 7th in Jakarta, Indonesia. The playing venue was the Graha Sitra Karaka PT Telkom and 110 players from seven nations competed, among them nine grandmasters and two women grandmasters. All top Indonesian players entered the field, including the legendary grandmasters Herman Sur Suradiradia and H. Ardianisia. Coming out from retirement, probably tempted by the 225,000 US dollar prize fund. After nine rounds of play, Grandmaster Cerdas Barus took a clear first place with seven and a half points to the delight of the local chess fans. Crucial was his last day victory with black pieces against international master Sadikin Irvanto. The International Chess Championship Zagreb Open 2011 will be played from April 11th to 18th at the Hotel Porin in Zagreb, Croatia. The organizer is the Zagreb Chess Federation and the system of play is 9 rounds of Swiss with 90 minutes for 40 moves plus 15 minutes for to the end of the game including 30 seconds increment for every move. The tournament will be split in two events, the Grandmaster Group for players rated above 2300 and the Master Group for players rated below. More information can be found at crowchess.com. The 28th Victor Chokaltia Memorial took place from March 25th to April 4th at the Hotel Olympia in Bucharest, Romania. Twelve players, seven Romanians and five from abroad competed in the Round Robin Tournament. Grandmaster Shabu convincingly won the tournament, collecting 8 points from 11 games. International Master Tarbas was probably hoping for a Grandmaster norm, but after a weak start with two losses, he must have been very satisfied with a shared second place together with Grandmaster Shishkin. Congratulations! The International Chess Festival Nakivan Open, dedicated to the memory of President Heydar Aliyev, is scheduled to take place from April 23rd to May 1st at the Nakivan Chess Center in Azerbaijan. The players will enter two tournaments, an A group for those rated above 2250 and women rated above 2100 and a B group. The festival is organized by the Azerbaijan Youth and Sports Ministry, Azerbaijan Chess Federation and Nakivan AR Chess Federation. The total prize fund is 66,500 US dollars. 
The TCEC Season 2 Premier Division, the highest league for computer chess, is underway. The defending champion Houdini is, defeated, is undefeated after Round 3 and is sharing the lead with Ivanhoe, Stockfish and Ripka. Houdini's draws with Black against Ripka and Stockfish do, however, seem to put Houdini in a favorable position right at the start of the event. Follow the championship on the official site tcec-chess.org. On behalf of FIBE and the Commonwealth Chess Association, Chess South Africa is inviting all chess players to participate in the 2011 Commonwealth and South African Open Chess Championships. The championships will run from Saturday, June 25th to Sunday, July 3rd. The playing venue will be the Emperor's Palace Hotel Casino and Convention Resort in Gwateng, South Africa. England's Grandmasters Nigel Short and Gavin Jones are currently top seeded in the main tournament. The 24th Magistral Ciudad de León, played June 2nd to 6th, will be a very interesting match. The world champion Viswanathan Anand will play six rapid games against Alexei Shirov, dubbed the Leonardo da Vinci of chess. The tournament was presented last week in Madrid. Grandmaster Ilias, uh, Miguel Iliesas, eight-time Spanish champion, recalled that the score between Anand and Shirov so far is very favorable to Anand, who is also a very tough opponent, because his play has no weak points, and even less so in rapid games. However, Iliesas added, the highly creative style of Shirov always leaves some room to surprise, and that this will be a clash of different styles. Further information can be found on advancedchessleon.com. The 12th European Individual Chess Championship was held in France from March 21st to April 3rd. 393 players from 41 countries fought for the title of European Champion. Among them was an impressive number of Grandmasters, 167 and 63 International Masters. Russian Grandmaster Vladimir Potkin, who started furiously with five consecutive victories, maintained the lead with a series of draws and by adding another win in the later stages, to eventually share the first place with three other players and claim the title of European Champion on superior tiebreak. Potkin, seeded only 40, 43rd before the start of the competition, finished with 8.5 points, together with Grandmaster Radoslav Wojtaszek, who won silver, bronze medalist Judith Polgar and Alexander Moisenko. Potkin boasted a fantastic 2822 ELO performance, which was also the first tiebreak criteria. The championship was a qualifier for the next World Chess Cup, and the top 23 finishers booked tickets for the County Mansis. The prize fund amounted to 120,000 euros. Congratulations! And finally, the news that I know you've all been waiting for since we told you that the US Championship will be organized by the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis again. The CCSCSL is now famous for its impeccable organization of great events in America and we're sure this year's championships won't be exceptions. The US Championships start this week on April 15th and will run until the 28th. The total prize fund for the 2011 U.S. Championship and U.S. Women's Championship is over $230,000. The championships, will, which will be starring the best and brightest of American chess, will be broadcast through a live show produced by Macaulay Peterson with Jennifer Shahade and Maurice Ashley hosting. More information can be found at uschesschamps.com. Last week we ended our analysis of the Scandinavian defense and in this week's episode we will take a look at the King's Gambit, a variation which is not often played anymore but a variation you have to learn nonetheless. The Gambit is introduced after e4, e5 and f4 and as you see a very aggressive game is building up. Because of this it's very important to get to know your theory since you otherwise can come into an unpleasant situation. So Alfred, how is one supposed to play from here? The most natural move in this situation is to take the pawn on f4 and it's also the most popular move in this position. The plan is quite simple. 
eliminate black's presence in the center for the price of a pawn. Furthermore, we see that if white moves the d-pawn, black will have to play g5 in order to protect the f4 pawn, since the white bishop on c1 now would threaten the pawn on f4. After the capture on f4, we, see we have a really tactical position before us, and black is a pawn up but white has a really strong initiative. Black can actually play other moves too in this position, and among them there is d5. Black counterattacks and leaves the pawn on e5 unguarded. Here black decides to keep the attack in the center instead of being a pawn up. The purpose with this move is to open up the center, something one always should try to do when the opponent has a weak king, as in this position. Worth noting is that white can't take the pawn on e5 here, because if white does that, black can play queen to h4 check, and after white to g3, black can take the pawn on e4 with a check, and winning the rook on h1. If white decides to play king to e2 instead of g3, black will win quite quickly. Black should still capture an e4 with a check, and after king to e f2, black plays bishop to c5 check and white is on its way to getting checkmated already in the opening. Now follows king to g3, queen takes on e5 check, king to f3 and queen to h5, winning the queen. White really shouldn't take the pawn on e5, instead a capture on d5 is to be recommended, and this is followed by black's e4, a move which stops white from developing the g1 knight to f3, simultaneously as it keeps the f4 pawn, pawn where it is, which is good for black, since it here only blocks the white bishop on c1. If white tries to remove the black e4 pawn by playing d3, black is to play knight to f6, and after an exchange on e4, white have to protect himself from both bishop to c5, which partially threatens knight to f2, and partially hinders white from being able to castle kingside. Furthermore, white also has to protect himself from the more direct threat, queen to h4 check, which will wreak havoc along the white lines. If white would try with playing knight to f3, black only has to play bishop to c5, and after a move like c4 protecting the d5 pawn, bishop to f2 check, king to e2, and queen to e7 follows. And one can see that white will lose really soon. The move d5 is very special in this opening, this since it's always been so that white has had the initiative, but after d5, white suddenly needs to protect himself, and black will be able to attack thanks to the many open lines, which are perfect for the bishop and because of the weak king. Now we will end this episode of the opening school, and we will be back next week with more on this opening, so see you then. After last week's retro chess puzzle, I thought it would fit well with a regular chess puzzle today. The theme of this chess puzzle is the art of checkmating a castled king. It is often said that the most important and safest move you could and should play at the beginning of the game is a castled king or queenside. But this does of course not save you from a checkmate. So you are to find a checkmate in two moves, white wins, good luck. Without any deeper analysis, we see that black has a tough time on the king's side. He has no pawns left on either h, g or f7, which puts him in a very vulnerable position. He has however some sort of an attack on the queen's side with the queen on a3, but he will need more pieces if he wants to checkmate the white king. 
White has a really strong attack on the Black King. Just look at the pawn on h6, for example. He has he is two steps from being promoted into a queen on h8. If we would take a step with the pawn, the Black King would probably escape, and later on, the Black Queen just would come to his rescue. And sure, we could play on it and take a chance, but it doesn't give us a checkmate in two moves, and we know that there is one here. We would like to use the diagonal to the king and check him on it, but the black wing guards it and trying to win the diagonal is really just a waste of time. So we won't let black get the time to build up a defense, we must act quickly and effectively. So how do we check in this position? Well, by capturing the bishop with the rook. Black has here two alternative answers. He can capture the rook or he can go to g8. If the king takes the rook, we checkmate on g7 thanks to the pawn on h6. And if the king instead goes to g8 hoping for a little long life, we simply play queen to g7 checkmate again. Well, a checkmate in two moves isn't much of a challenge for you anymore, but it's surely a nice break from everything that's tough in your everyday life. To just sink into a chess puzzle and manage to solve it. It's a great feeling to succeed. And that's what chess is for. As I mentioned in a previous program, Caxton translated the morality work of the monk Jacobus de Sisolis into English and published it in 1474 as one of the first books printed in England. It was entitled Game and Play of the Chess, but was in fact a morality work based on chess in an allegorical form rather than an instructional chess book. The first printed book that treated the game of chess as such is said to have been Libre del Jox Partitis del Shax en Nombre de Cent, with apologies for my pronunciation of Catalan. It was, as far as we know, published in Valencia in 1495, and the reason that I express myself so vaguely is that there is no extant copy of this book. The last copy was destroyed in 1811 during the French occupation of Montserrat where the book is supposed to have been located in a Benedictine monastery. The earliest extant book on the game of chess is instead Repetition de Amores y Arte de Ajedrez, published in Salamanca in Spain, 1497. It looks like this. And we note that the full title contains the addition of Con el Juegos de Partido. Well, this is not one of the uh, ten extant copies of this rare book, it's just a facsimile copy of the book. And uh, books printed before 1500 are known as Incunabula, and this book therefore qualifies as that, since it was printed as early as 1497. Anyway, the author of this book was Luis Ramirez de Lucena, who then was a student at the University of Salamanca. The title of the book can be translated to something like A Discourse on Love and the Art of Playing Chess, and the title suggests a peculiar combination of two quite different themes, and that's exactly what it is. The first part is really a treatise on love, and according to the magazine Biblio, it has an anti-feminist perspective, if one can attribute such values to work from the late 1400s. The copy of this book that is preserved in the Princeton University Library contains only the chess part, but this book, this facsimile copy, has both. And the chess section contains descriptions of openings, advice for sound style of playing chess, lots of positions with diagrams, and some facts about the older versions of chess. The book contains some facts about rook endgames and not less than 150 positions with diagrams, some of which are played under the old rules. But the book still represents the transition to the new rules of the game. The rules in Lucena's book were not completely identical to the modern ones, 
but we skip the details here. The opening descriptions deal with 11 openings, but it's worth noting that none of them begin with D2 to D4, and in one of the opening descriptions he mixes up the old and the new rules of chess. So one can really see this book as representing a transition period for chess. Among Lucina's general advice for playing chess, we can mention that he recommends sticking to water instead of wine, at least during the games. Problems range from mate in two moves to ten moves. And as one example of the problems, we consider the following diagram from Lucena's book. It is a two-move problem that in Murray's History of Chess is mentioned and translated into the following diagram. The solution is simple. White starts by moving the c-pawn one step, and if black checks with rook to e6, white continues with knight to c6 mate. If black instead promotes his pawn to a queen, white continues with knight to b3 mate. Murray also notes that Lucena's book does not seem to have had any significant influence on the chess development in Europe, maybe because of the small number of printed copies. But uh, we end here today and we'll return next week with a new theme, so see you then. We'd like to thank you all for watching this episode of Chess TV and we hope that you'll watch next week as well when we're back with a new and fresh episode. Have a nice week until then. Bye.